Okay, we're getting a few. Good. Good afternoon. Hello, Jackie, Hello. how are you? I'm good. You all right? Yes. Hello, Lou. And it's noon, Dr. Crean, if you want to get started. Oh, okay, yes, so, so okay, hello. Uh, welcome one and all to uh, our second of eight talks uh, for Great Decisions uh, 2021, uh, the role of international organizations in a pandemic. Uh, first, I would like to announce that this lecture series is a collaboration of the League of Women Voters of Tyler Smith County, the AAUW American Association of University Women of Tyler, the Tyler Public Library, and the Foreign Policy Association. Uh, I am honored and pleased today uh, to be uh, introducing as our featured speaker, Christine Crudo Blackburn. Uh, so uh, Christine Crudo Blackburn uh, currently uh, serves as the Deputy Director of the Pandemic and Biosecurity Program at the Scowcroft Institute of International Affairs in the Bush School of Government and Public Service at Texas A&M, conducting research on various aspects of pandemic disease policy and control. Uh, she teaches at the Bush School and the Texas A&M School of Public Health. Dr. Blackburn received her PhD in 2015 from Washington State University uh, as part of a uh, interdisciplinary doctoral program where she specialized in not one, not two, but three fields, uh, political science, communications, and veterinary clinical sciences slash global animal health. Uh, her uh, doctoral work involved her constructing a mathematical model that uh, allowed for quantified policy and communication inputs to determine how different disease intervention policies and communication strategies impact the spread of a disease outbreak. Uh, this is all, of course, obviously a vital work, uh, you know, and, and vital information for our own present time. I think of all our talks uh, of the eight we're having uh, this uh January and February. This is obviously the one that is uh, most pertinent to our daily lives. And with that, uh, it is my honor then to present to you uh, as our speaker, uh, Professor Christine Blackburn. And uh, just so you know, uh, we'll be uh, having, uh, after uh, Professor Blackburn gives her presentation, we'll be having a, a question and answer period. So be ready with your questions for her afterwards. And uh, also, uh, just so people know, uh, this presentation is being recorded for posting at YouTube, on YouTube. And so, uh, Professor Blackburn, uh, the floor is yours. Hey, thank you so much. Let me um, start here by sharing my screen. Um, can everybody see that OK? Yes? All right. Yes, we can. OK, perfect. I'm going to take your the OK. So um, as Dr. Crean said, I'm the deputy director of the pandemic and biosecurity policy program at the Bush School um, at A&M, which is kind of a new program designed to bring together the elements of science and the elements of policy that go together when you're talking about issues of uh, biosecurity, whether that's a pandemic or bioterrorism or those sorts of things. And um, and again, as uh, as was mentioned, I have an interdisciplinary doctorate, which is I know maybe something that you guys are not familiar with. I'm kind of an outlier there. Um, but one of the main things that I focus on in my research and um, that I'm going to bring in a little bit today when we talk about is that um, is understanding the threat of emerging zoonotic diseases of which SARS-CoV-2, the virus that causes COVID, it's an emerging zoonotic disease, which means it's a disease that transmits naturally between animals and humans. Um, and understanding those types of diseases specifically, and then how we can craft better policy, whether it's international policy or domestic policy, and how we can um, structure crisis communication and risk communication that's more effective and can help us better respond to outbreaks. Um, and so that, that's kind of, been my focus and um, I'm going to bring in a little, like I said, I'm going to bring in a little bit of that um, when we talk today. Okay, so the, the title of my, my presentation today is the role of international organizations in the global pandem 
in a global pandemic. So this is not just specific to COVID. Um, this is really talking about any time that we face a global pandemic. And for that reason, I wanted to start um, by giving a little bit of background on um, pandemics outside of COVID-19. So some of you might be really familiar with this information, some of you less so, but I really just wanted to make sure that we had a good solid jumping off point for the rest of the conversation. And so I, there, there have been a lot of pandemics throughout human history, but I just chose the three that I think are the most prominent or the most well-known of the pandemics. And the first one um, is the Black Death, which was caused by the, by the plague. So I think when we learn about this in our history classes or whatever classes we learn about the Black Death in, I think it's often said that it's the bubonic plague, which it was, but um, it's most likely a combination of bubonic plague and pneumonic plague um, because it had such a high, um, high lethality. So that pandemic, the Black Death killed, you know, 25 to 50 million people and um, about a third of Europe's population. So that was a very impactful and um, devastating pandemic. And then there's the 1918 flu. I think this has been the most referenced historical pandemic before COVID-19, but definitely throughout um, COVID-19. And this pandemic is believed to have killed 50 to 90 million people, which was about a third of the entire world's population. And based on what estimate you use from World Wars I and II, more than both of those war wars combined. I mean, the thing that was really interesting about that pandemic was that it killed killed healthy people between the ages of um, 20 and 40. So it really wiped out a lot of the workforce and um, people that were really um, in that in those prime years. And then the last one um, is HIV AIDS. And I think a lot of us forget that this was actually a pandemic because it slowly morphed into an um, it's slowly morphed into an endemic disease, which means that it's always there. But when it first started out, it was a pandemic disease. And um, to date, it's killed 32 million people worldwide. So it's one of the more devastating pandemics that we have experienced. Um, and this picture, I like to, I like this picture because I think it shows this from the 1918 flu. I think it shows how um, serious it was, how many people were sick. This was kind of one of those mass um, field hospital setups that um, that were created to try to deal with the number of people who were infected. All right, so now let's just talk about where we are in the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, as of this morning, so I, I marked on here that it was from 1030 this morning, there uh, have been 92.5 million infections worldwide and close to 2 million deaths globally. And then the United States, we have about 23 million infections and 385,178 deaths. And I think what's really noticeable about where we are in the pandemic right now in the United States is that um, we're averaging, you know, some days are more, some days are less, but we're really averaging around 3,000 deaths per day in the United States. So if you conceptualize that with other tragedies that our country has experienced, that's, that's like, um, the number of people who died in 9-11 dying every day. Okay, so this is, um, this is a, we're kind of in a very severe part of the pandemic right now. And um, this has been happening, that, that death count has been happening for the last several months and, you know, is kind of the death count we're expecting for the next couple of months to come, depending on how well the rest of the vaccine rollout goes. So that's kind of the background I wanted to give all of you, just as, just as a baseline before we delve into the, um, to international organizations, the different types of international organizations and the role they play in dealing with, um, with diseases like this. Uh, and then I, I wanna, um, I'm trying to keep overall the, the discussion fairly short because I wanna make sure that everyone has time to ask whatever questions um, they may wanna ask about this pandemic, past pandemics, how international organizations work together in responding to a pandemic and so on. Um, so, uh, the unique challenges, okay, this is one, sorry, but I almost skipped over this part, but I think this is really under, important to understanding why international organizations in particular are so important for pandemics where they might not be as important for other issues of national security or homeland security. And the first one is that, um, as we always say in my profession, diseases don't respect borders. They don't, they don't know borders. They don't understand borders. 
Um, and global travel makes it much easier for a disease to move from one country to another during its incubation period. So somebody who's sick can get from you know, one part of the world to another part of the world in less than 24 hours before they might even have symptoms or know that they're infecting people. So this is one of the things that makes you know, pandemics or infectious disease that diseases that haven't even reached pandemic potential yet, um, really important for international organizations to be part of, of that response. Um, and then the other part, like I said, I look at emerging diseases specifically, and I think that the emerging disease element is another reason why international organizations are so important in responding to pandemics. Um, and, and that's because if you think of what an emerging disease is, it's something that we have never come across we've never come across before. So it can be either something that's brand new that we've never heard of that we didn't know existed, or it can be the emergence of a disease we know about in a place that it's never existed before. So um, that's things like, uh, say there's a disease here in Texas called Chagas disease. It's mostly found in um, Central America, but it's also been in, in the Rio Grande Valley area for thousands of years, and that's creeping northward in the United States. So now it's emerging in states farther north than it wasn't before. That's also considered an emerging disease. But I think when we talk about the role of international organizations in pandemic response, um, the emerging disease element in terms of something that we've never seen before is um, really vital because if you if you think about what international organizations and international collaboration brings to bear on a situation like that, it the world is already at a disadvantage when you have a, an emerging disease. Um, because we don't know what it is, we don't know how it spreads, we don't know how it works, we don't know who's most vulnerable, we don't have any of that information. And so using international organizations to coordinate um, global response in these situations can, um, allow us to bring more minds and more resources, whether that's just financial resources or actual equipment, supplies, laboratory space, all of those things. We can bring those all together to work on the one singular problem. I think that's something that we saw you know, in the vaccine effort. That's something that we really saw with COVID-19 is just that was probably the biggest um, collective effort made in the history of science. Um, and it was pretty impressive what, what the global science community did um, finding a, a vaccine for, for COVID. Okay, so now we can turn to what international organizations are relevant to pandemics. There's a lot of different types of international organizations and they kind of fall into a couple, I guess, major categories and um, there's, there's three categories that I'm gonna talk about. Those are intergovernmental organizations, bilateral organizations, and non-governmental organizations. And so I kind of created a short list of some of the major um, international organizations that are involved specifically with pandemics. So if you have, um, let's say you have a disease, but it's as a result of a bioweapons attack or a bioterrorist attack, then you would have more organizations involved. But if you have a naturally occurring disease outbreak, these are some of the major organizations. So you have WHO, which is arguably the biggest um, international organization when you're talking about pandemics. Um, there's the World Bank, which plays a really essential role, not only in pandemic preparedness, but also in helping with the response and making sure funds are released um, so that uh, medical professionals, local governments, federal governments can all take action. Um, UNICEF typically focused more on children, but they play a really important role in low income countries when you're talking about disease prevention and response. And then you have, you know, we have some domestic, which are called bilateral organizations. I'll go into what that really means and what their role is here in a minute, but like USAID or the CDC. And then the last, the last kind of set is um, MSF, which is one of the most prominent um, non-governmental medical organizations. So that's like Doctors Without Borders, um, IMC, and then you have things like Red Cross or Red Crescent. Um, okay, so the well, I'm going to start with the intergovernmental organizations. So this is this like first set. 
of, um, of types of organizations, international organizations that respond. And so the strengths of these organizations are really that they are there to help coordinate across governments and they can help mobilize funds in a global manner to help countries respond when you have a pandemic. I think one of the misunderstandings um, that we saw a lot in the spring and like into the summer about intergovernmental organizations is that they don't actually have much direct power. So, um, you know, we, a, a lot this summer there was conversations about WHO and some of the weaknesses of WHO and whether or not they should have gone into China um, to find out what was going on. And one of the things to keep in mind there and with other intergovernmental organizations is that WHO doesn't have the power to do that. Um, they have to be invited into a country to investigate an outbreak. Um, and so going in without an invite is, is a violation of state, state sovereignty. So this is one of the weaknesses of intergovernmental organizations is that if, if like WHO is not invited in to the country, they have to operate this global response based only on the information that they're getting from the country without kind of an independent um, examination of what's going on with the outbreak. Um, and so World Bank is a little bit different because they're really focused on the, um, the funding as aspect of it. So one of the criticisms of World Bank has been that um, when you have a pandemic, funding is just, it's so slow to be released. So their role really is to make sure that those resources are there, um, but it's still a bureaucracy. So you still have to go through all of those hoops to make sure that that money can be released. Um, and there have been some suggestions from individuals at the World Bank about having a pandemic insurance program, essentially, so that countries are paying insurance, um, kind of like you would with your car insurance, you're paying insurance. And so if you have a pandemic, that money is there to be released um, immediately rather than trying to um, put together the funding. That has been, oh gosh, discussed for a long time now, and there hasn't been any action on it, but that's one of the things that World Bank has been talking about to make the intergovernmental work that they do um, a little bit more effective. Um, and so then we have what uh, the non-governmental organization, and these can really take like all shapes and sizes. They can be large organizations like MSF, or they can be very small organizations. Um, but I think in the, in the realm of health security broadly, so what, pandemics or just disease outbreaks or epidemics like Ebola, um, MSF is is really one of the biggest players. And these groups, when you're talking about pandemics or disease response, these are kind of like the on the ground groups. So they're the ones that they go in, they set up medical tents, they provide medical services, they provide equipment and supplies, and they train, um, they train local responders to, to either treat people in the medical tents or how to identify symptoms. Um, they do a lot of communication with local communities wherever they're responding to the pandemic um, or the disease outbreak. Um, and they do things beyond just pandemics and infectious disease outbreaks. But since the, the talk is focused on that, I'm gonna kind of stay in that lane. And they can also do things like um, contact tracing or other things that assist with disease containment activities. So their role, like I said, compared to intergovernmental organizations, which are kind of these overarching bureaucracies that help to coordinate and um, establish collaboration, the non-governmental organizations um, are really those ones that are that are on the ground, that are um, there doing doing the day-to-day -day work. And then the last set, like I mentioned, are bilateral organizations, um, and these. These organizations also play an important, an important role, but they're they're a little bit different than say the non-governmental organizations. So these are going to be organizations that receive funding through their home government, but they can undertake international disease response activities. Um, and so I, I just use, I mean, there's examples of these from every country. But I just used, I think, some of the more familiar ones from the United States, and that's USAID um, and the CDC. Uh, and so I think the best way to conceptualize what the bilateral agencies are, are doing is they can provide this really broad 
range of services. So they can provide expertise um, kind of from an oversight level, a little bit more like an intergovernmental organization is doing, but they can also provide personnel and that on the ground work that some of the nonprofit organizations are doing or not non-governmental organizations are doing. And then they can also be this entity that really provides funding um, for work to be done by other organizations. So they, they have a broader mandate, but they are tied specifically to a, um, whatever their home countries funding is. And they can do, they can either be focused internationally. So USAID is a, a good example of a bilateral organization that's focused, really focused internationally, um, or they can be focused domestically, or they can be focused that, you know, they can have a little bit of both. So the CDC is a good example of, of a bilateral organization that has both a domestic mission, which its domestic mission is, is probably larger than its international mission, but it also has an international mission. So there are CDC labs um, set up across, in countries across, uh, across the world. Um, and so all of the, I mean, I think the main takeaway from understanding these organizations is that each set, when you're talking about a pandemic, um, and especially a respiratory virus, which is what the SARS-CoV-2 virus is, and what some of the more devastating pandemics throughout history is, is you have, um, and if it's an emerging disease, so I'll add that too, uh, the world is kind of starting behind, right? The virus is spreading, um, it's moving across the world really quickly, and so you have these layers of international organizations that are there to respond and ideally in an ideal world where everything um, we as pandemic preparedness and response people hope for is that all of these organizations will be prepared they'll have communicated ahead of time they'll be very aware of each other's roles and how they're supposed to work together and um, each one will play their role in response um, in reality i think in pretty much every pandemic it hasn't really gone that that way unfortunately um, but it's just another one of those lessons, I think, that we've taken from a lot of um, our past pandemics um, and will be taking from the COVID-19 pandemic is just that the importance of this international coordination and the involvement of international organizations is, is central when you're talking about a pandemic, because as I mentioned, by its nature, it is, um, is a global problem. So I, I want to stop there. Like I said, it's going to be really short, but I really wanted to allow time for questions and, um, and I guess kind of discussion if anyone wants to do that, but questions first off. So, and there's my contact information. If you have a qu question later that you didn't think of today, you feel free to email me. This is Marilyn. I have a question and we were going to use chat, but I think with the group that we have, we can go ahead and just have people ask their questions. But mine would be when you talked about the World Bank, um, where do those funds come from that are that the bank is working with? Is that from lots of different countries and they're just housing money there? Does it come from the government? I don't really understand how all that works. Um, yeah, and I will admit I'm not an expert in the World Bank, so the specific intricacies of all of it, um, I'm not 100% clear on, but my understanding is it's fairly similar to how WHO operates, where you have contributions from countries um, that help to establish that like baseline of funding, and then um, you can have additional funding mechanisms on top of that baseline. So. Um, you would have your kind of required fund funding and then your if you wanted to make a voluntary contribution on top of that but the world bank as i understand can also give loans so they can make money off of repayment interest kind of like um in an international monetary fund so it's a little bit more like a financial institution than um some of some of the other intergovernmental organizations. Well, I was just wondering how some of the countries who have almost no resources are managing and where they would get funding to do all the things they need to do to 
get rid of the virus, but without many resources. We're lucky here that we have so many resources, but some countries are not. Yeah, and so typically like in disease response, um, there's, there's uh, depending on where the country is, if they have any pre-established infrastructure or they have any money that they can commit, then they'll commit that. But then you have funding that gets released from WHO, which again is kind of a mixture of everyone's contribution. Um, then they can get kind of these loans from the World Bank. Um, but then usually, depending on how significant the disease is, you'll have individual countries who will give money to that country. So even if they don't have the resources, um, say the, the US might say, well, we're gonna give you $2 million um, because we have the resources and so you don't, and we really need you to control this disease before it ends up in the US. It's kind of the thought process. So then they're able to build that money that they need to respond yeah, through a bunch of different mechanisms. Thank you. Uh, we have a question from Tammy. Uh, 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 the World Health Organization uses specific medical codes to track diseases and recovery. Is that the standard method for tracking the numbers? Um, so each, I would say, like, in terms of how many cases and deaths there have been, yeah, I mean, with WHO, it's a little bit complicated, because like I said, it all relies on reporting from other countries. So you see a place like Syria is like, we've only had 600 cases. It's probably unlikely, um, but there isn't a good, there, there isn't a good tracking mechanism um, in place. And WHO, unfortunately, has to use what they're told. So yes, that's how the numbers are tracked, but you're going to have variance based on uh, you're going to have variance based on what the country tells you. So sometimes that can be they just don't have the resources to track, and sometimes that can be they're being dishonest about the numbers, um, and sometimes that can be which we found out with things like um, dengue and uh, Zika and some of the those diseases. We found that countries just have different case definitions. So in the United States, we would report something as a case um, and another country would have that case, but they wouldn't report it because they don't consider it a case based on their individual country case definition. So you get those, um, those challenges when you're looking at what the, the actual number of cases is um, when it's reported to an organization. And we have a, another question from Jackie. Uh, I know your list isn't necessarily inclusive, but where do mercy ships fit into this picture? I would say they're typically like a non-governmental organization. So they're those kind of like on the ground, they're providing additional supplies and equipment and medical expertise um, to the location, wherever they're, they're going, they're stationed. And a question from Marilyn, which seems to be a working off of uh, Tammy's uh, question just now, do you feel our tracking of numbers and deaths is accurate? Um, I think it's as accurate as we can do. So in every pandemic um, or every disease outbreak, but especially where a lot of people die, um, at the end, we almost have to look at the number of people who died above the baseline because we're, especially at the beginning, you miss a lot of people who die from the disease because you just don't know what's going on. And so I think at this point, we are pretty accurate, but if you like um, in the Rio Grande Valley in particular, that's an area of concern because a lot of people are um, not seeking medical care for one reason or the other. So maybe they are dying at home and then they're never counted as a COVID case. Um, and at the beginning, you know, there's this like multi-layered system that, that we use in the United States to make sure that if we count someone as a COVID death, that they're legitimately a COVID death. So they didn't die of whatever their underlying morbidity was, um, comorbidity. And so at the beginning of the pandemic, if somebody hadn't been tested for COVID, but they died, they might've died of COVID, COVID, but since they weren't tested, they weren't counted. So I would say we have a pretty accurate count compared to some other countries. But I think at the end, when we look back at what the normal amount of deaths that occur in a year are, then you look at how many above that occurred and how many of those are accounted for by 
the COVID deaths that we have recorded. And you can kind of get an idea of how many of those deaths we might have missed. But you can also get an idea because one of the big things about COVID, so here in College Station, our hospitals are at over 100% ICU capacity. So one of the other like things that is taken into account when you talk about excess deaths is who died not from COVID, but because of the pandemic. So if somebody is out on the road right now and they get in an accident and they need life, you know, life-saving medical care, but every ICU unit in College Station is full um, and they can't get that care. And then maybe they're flown to another hospital that's five hours away and they die in route. Whereas if there had been ICU units, they could have been saved. So those people are also included not as deaths from COVID, but as pandemic related deaths. And like I said, we get that all at the end and we can't count any of that right now. Ah, very good. A uh, question from Tom. Uh, he uh, first apologizes, sorry if this question is too broad. Uh, the, when you have these sorts of organizations in charge of billions of dollars, things don't always work all the time. What do you believe is the greatest hindrance to these organizations operating at their fullest capacity? Um, that's a, I mean, it is a broad question, but I think it's a good question. I think if you're going to look at one and one like overarching broad answer, right, it's bureaucracy in general. So every time you have a lot of people and a lot of money and a lot of interests, you're going to have all of these kind of obstacles in to getting um, a response going, whether it's the release of funds or the mobilization of people. and um, you know, bureaucracy moves slowly at all times, um, but usually moves too slowly in pandemics specifically because you have kind of a crisis happening where people are dying. So if I was gonna give a broad answer, it would be just the, the size and kind of cumbersome nature of moving things through bureaucracy. Ah, very good. Uh, question from Tammy. Do you see a difference in numbers of deaths based on the country's ability to access healthcare? Is that even tracked in all countries? Um, I love this question because my focus of research is access to healthcare. So I I don't know if I haven't seen anywhere where that specifically has been looked into. I've seen a lot looking at um, places where infrastructure is not sufficient. So thinking like they don't have the ability to to test or treat people so we have inaccurate numbers. But I haven't seen um, you know, places like um, in the United States, we have a lot of people who don't have access to healthcare, whether it's because they don't have insurance or because they live in a very rural area and rural hospitals are being closed down, right? And they'd have to drive four hours to the closest hospital. Um, and so I haven't seen any information on places that have strong health infrastructure like the United States, and a lack of access to healthcare's impact on, on COVID. I think, you know, some of the, the things that I've seen out of the Rio Grande Valley, which is where I do a lot of research, um, would suggest that that has an impact, but obviously there's, there's definitely just not enough right now to know for sure. Uh, excellent. Uh, I'd like to use my prerogative as the uh, uh, person, uh, the moderator here, to ask uh, a question of my own uh, for Professor Blackburn. So uh, we've had a series of not nearly as devastating, but you know, near pandemics in the last 20 years. What have organizations like the World Health Organization and others learned from past experiences and things like SARS and MERS and Zika, uh, which they were able to apply successfully uh, to uh, our current situation? And secondly, what lessons are there that experts like you believe they should have learned but have not learned and applied? Oh, yeah, okay. Um, I think that in general, um, I guess I'll answer the last question first because I would say in general, some of the challenges in pandemic preparedness is that we don't learn lessons very well. And so when we're talking about what lessons have we or should we have learned, um, there, there's a lot, you know? I think we look at, um, like for example, so I'm, I'm very interested in, in the impact of, um, of school closures on education. 
So in the Ebola pandemic, uh, we, they closed schools for a long time. And the impact of that was a lot of women never returned to school. A lot of girls never returned to school. So their education was cut short. Um, it, it you know, led to this inequity, greater inequity um, in the countries for women because they didn't achieve the education they would have otherwise achieved without school closures. Um, but, and there were other lessons, but you know, going into this pandemic, that's something that we, we, didn't, we didn't learn and we didn't think about, All right? So that's just like one example of kind of going forward with what our responses have always been without thinking about, okay, what have we seen when we did this response in other scenarios? Um, in terms of, of what we did well, I think the international response overall was much swifter than it has been in the past. So if you look at the pandemic before this one was, or it wasn't a pandemic, it was an epidemic, was the most recent Ebola, so not 2014, but 2016. And 2014, WHO received a lot of criticism for taking forever to recognize the pandemic. And so if you look at this, um, the response, not only from the international organizations, but from individual countries, for the most part, was much quicker. And that's really important when you're talking about a disease that spreads easily. So I would say that's one of the um, bigger, I guess, positive uh, things that have uh, come out of it. And if you take like, this isn't so much international organizations, but if you take like individual countries, you can look at um, Germany and they started creating diagnostic kits before the virus even arrived in Germany. So seeing that, learning those lessons that we need to be able to track something um, on, on just a country level, some countries learn their lessons, whereas others did not as much. Right, very good. We have three questions in the queue here. I'll go through them in order. First from Marilyn. Are you familiar with the rollout for vaccines here in the U.S. and do you think it is realistic? I guess that must mean schedule or uh, is realistic. With the process, the, the the I guess in this case this would be the timelines, the estimation for how many doses will be available and administered at what timeline. Um. Yeah, I mean I'm familiar with the general structure and setup and plan. Um, I'm not familiar with the specific logistics. I'm, I think one of the one of the bigger challenges, right, was the the need to keep the Pfizer vaccine at such a low temperature. Um, and I know the way that that was handled to try to make sure that rollout went as smoothly as possible was to build these giant freezer um, farms, essentially, where you could keep large doses of the vaccine. Uh, and so I, I just kind of know though the the broad broad um, scale, but I can I can go more in depth if there's something specific you're wondering about. Okay. Hold on that now, I'll go to uh, Luann's question. In your experience, how vital is the work of the World Health Organization in monitoring, tracking, and containing an emerging disease, outbreak, or full-blown pandemic as we have now? Um, yeah, uh, so this is my, I'll say this is my personal opinion. I think the World Health Organization is extremely important to global health in every form, um, whether that's just a neglected tropical disease or a, a pandemic. The, the World Health Organization is really the only health oriented organization that has the ability to coordinate on a global scale. Um, and there are, like anything, there are definitely weaknesses. There are definitely reforms that could be made, but I think that it is that organization in particular is just is central to our ability to respond to a pandemic. Excellent. And now the question from Jackie: How do these organizations impact the distribution of the vaccines? How does WHO impact uh, it? these organizations? I guess WHO would be one example of the international organizations included in this question. Um, so the biggest role that these organizations have are going to be with either coordinating um, vaccine distribution in low income countries, or in actually administering vaccines in those places. Uh, you know, the way that the vaccine is distributed, this vaccine is distributed is really the, the company, whatever pharmaceutical company because there's several now, you know, they are coordinating with each individual government to sell them 
a certain amount of vaccines and to then get those vaccines to them. And then each government is responsible for distributing it as they see fit. Um, WHO or NGOs like MSF or whatever, they, they really come into play when there's countries that might not have the political or infrastructural capacity to do that themselves. So they come in and they assist and provide that infrastructure and that expertise and make sure that vaccines get where they need to go and be given to the people that need them. Uh, excellent. And uh, another question of mine uh, relating to your one of your many fields of expertise, communications, which you didn't really talk uh, have a chance to delve into in your presentation. Uh, what role uh, or part do these international organizations, in your opinion, can they play in terms of spreading correct information to the publics of these different countries and combating misinformation, both of which have been a major issue with our current uh, situation, both in the US and abroad? Um, anytime you're talking about crisis communication or risk communication, one of the main things that you need is a, a singular credible spokesperson. So some of these organizations offer that at the international level. So if you talk about you know, the, the WHO, they, they can act as a, a, a spokesperson. But even if you look like lower um, down at the country level, some of these places, things like Red Cross or um, MSF, they can act as that credible spokesperson within a country and they can help um, combat information, misinformation, and they can pro provide factual information through um, there are different kind of like educational campaigns or health education campaigns. So I think they all, all of these in organizations have a really important role in communication. Um, but the message, you know, this is one of the problems we saw with COVID is that the message has to be consistent because if it's not consistent, it's confusing to people, you know, not, not everyone in the world is a virologist and no one should be expected to understand all of the complications of pandemics. And so, if there's conflicting messages and different messages that really undermines the, the, the scientific message that needs to be heard and allows misinformation to kind of come to the surface because people don't know what they should believe and what they should be doing. And so, um, yeah, that's, that's kind of the role that the organization should play as being that singular spokesperson with like, you know, consistent messaging at every level. Yes, uh, and relating to that, uh, getting specifically to the vaccination process, I know that in the past there's been fairly severe resistance and misinformation in places like Pakistan and Nigeria with, I believe, polio vaccine and uh, sorts of things in, in, uh, in certain communities. And I'm wondering uh, uh, how, uh, what is your, uh, your level of worry about similar sorts of misinformation campaigns uh, in, in many countries, uh, preventing full distribution and uh, uh, you know of, of the vaccine and uh, acceptance of uh, vaccination, I think it's very worrisome. The numbers that we've seen um, from like surveys that have been conducted shows that the vaccine hesitancy with COVID nineteen is higher than most other vaccines, and it, and the reasons vary by country. You know whether it's um, Afghanistan and Pakistan and their experiences with the polio campaign, or it's, you know, France, most of the resistance in France comes from their experience with the 2009 H1N1 vaccine and some issues that they had with that vaccine. Um, and then here in the United States, it really stems from a, a general distrust of the, the government, you know, and whether the government is doing what's in the best interest. Um, that's what, what the surveys have shown. And so, I think it's a huge issue because people, we need to reach a certain um, level of vaccination in order to really have any impact on the pandemic. And so if there's so much hesitancy that we in this country, but also globally can't reach that level, then, um, then nothing changes, right? We're still in the same position that we were before the vaccines were rolled out. Uh, and uh, 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 how would you rate the role of uh, the level of international cooperation, both with at the organ level of the international organizations and also at the country level compared with previous campaigns. I'm thinking, for instance, kind of the one people always cite as the successful example of cooperation is uh, with smallpox eradication. Uh, what has changed over the generations from kind of in the past where people saw it as kind of a, you know, 
perhaps in retrospect, you know, Gosley, a golden age of public health cooperation. Uh, how, how has this been different? Um, I think compared to the smallpox campaign, it's been very different. I mean, the smallpox campaign was, was amazing, right? Like that was a, a, a huge level of coordination, though. I would say with the COVID-19 vaccine, you know, one, you have all of these different groups working on a vaccine, which is a good thing uh, because we can't produce that many vaccines. So the more vaccine options you have, the more vaccines you can give people more quickly. So I, I'm not saying that as a bad thing. Um, but I think, you know, there was, there's really two elements to, to the coordination of vaccination. Right now, countries, um, for the most part, are being left to determine their vaccine rollout themselves. If you take something like smallpox, that wasn't really how it was, right? It, smallpox vaccination campaign was orchestrated by WHO. They oversaw it. They made sure that the vaccines went out and that was run through that organization. That's not how the COVID vaccine is going. Um, the COVID vaccine is run by individual governments and then WHO stepping in, like I, I said, in, in instances where the, the country doesn't have the ability. Um, and then there was the COVAX initiative, which was the, the international agreement that um, some countries entered into, the United States did not, um, which was to make sure that there was e equitable distribution of the vaccine, which meant that all countries around the world had an equal opportunity rather than um, wealthy countries receiving the vaccine first. Yes. So that was, I would say, the most coordinated international effort on the vaccine, but it was, it's not at the scale of the smallpox vaccine. Okay, uh, and we have a question from Luann. Given your experience, what is your level of concern regarding the likelihood of future and more frequent outbreaks slash pandemics of emerging diseases? I think that it's very likely. That's one of the things that I look at in my research is you can see over the last couple of decades, we have this acceleration of emerging diseases. And that's for a, a, you know, a variety of reasons, um, some of which is you know, urbanization, population density, habitat destruction. Like if you look at the emergence of Lyme disease in the United States, um, it's related to suburban sprawl because as people moved out into the forest, they came in contact with these ticks in a way that they hadn't previously. Um, and so I think that all of the changes, I think it's multi-layered, I don't think it's one thing, but I think if we look at all of the changes that are bringing humans into closer contact with animals, it's allowing these diseases that might've otherwise been contained in animal populations to cross the species barrier and to um, emerge in the human popu population. And if we're looking at the current pandemic, we didn't even, really no. I mean, it was assumed, but it had never been seen that coronaviruses could infect more than one species. And so that was 2003 was the first time we even knew that coronaviruses from a bat could infect humans. And now here we are, you know, less than 20 years later, and we have a massive coronavirus pandemic. Um, so yeah, the rate is accelerating. I think we can expect a lot more emerging disease concerns um, going forward. Yes, and related to that, what can countries and international organizations do you feel, can they do to, uh, to limit uh, the chances of these animal-borne diseases jumping to, to humans? Uh, I mean, obviously you can't stop urbanization or sprawl into the forest areas and things like that very easily. What, what can countries do to uh, improve public health and act uh, in a preventative way to, uh, to curb or limit or prevent future potential epidemics or pandemics so along, you know, crossing the species barrier as your uh, focus of research is? Um, it's, I think it's a huge challenge. I guess that's where I'll start. You know, the, the that was essentially what the PREDICT program was trying to do. The PREDICT program is now very controversial. So, um, you know, a lot of people have different opinions on it and whether it was successful or whether it was a failure, but essentially there, that was aimed at testing animals mm -hmm. and, um, compiling diseases and, um, the, the Virome project, which hasn't gotten funding to get off the ground, has kind of the same idea. We'll just make a database of all viruses that are out there. So if one of them ends up in people, then we'll at least have a head start. Um, and again, that one hasn't got funding or gotten off the ground. So there, there are these ideas that prevention needs to come through more understanding 
so that we're testing, you know, there was, I think part of the predict project was look, having um, people who hunt bushmeat in places like Africa, they would, they had these little kits that they would be sent out with and they would get some blood from the animal that they killed and they would give it to the scientists there and they would test it to see what kinds of viruses were present. Because a lot of the emerging diseases that we look at, they, they come from the, that kind of interaction between people and humans or people and animals. So um, I think that's one method, again, it's very, the programs that have been in place are very controversial. Um, and the other is making sure that our infrastructure is, is prepared. So um, our hospitals, like here in the US, we have some of the best infrastructure, but even here we have, you know, declining availability of hospitals in a lot of areas of the country, you know, where I came from, you had to have life flight insurance because if you had a serious problem, they were gonna have to airlift you somewhere. And so I think that the, the, the failure of, um, of access, whether physical or financial is, is something that we need to deal with if we're gonna be able to respond effectively to pandemics because people need to be able to get healthcare as soon as they get sick. Because if you walk around sick for a week, then you're infecting more people and it just makes it that much harder to know what the disease is and how to contain it and all of that. Ah, very good. A question from Tom. In your opinion, what is the biggest lesson we can learn from the COVID-19 pandemic and hopefully implement in the next eventual pandemic? The biggest lesson. Wow, that's a that's a hard question. Oh my gosh. Okay. Um I don't know. The, I don't know. I think, um, I think the biggest lesson for me, so I don't know if this is the biggest lesson. I think you would get a different answer if you talk to everyone. But the biggest lesson for me is that we really all need to be on the same page. Because if we're not all on the same page, whether that's within our country or outside of our country as an international um, community, uh, we, you just can't stop disease. Right? because disease needs a susceptible host. And so if everyone isn't in agreement on how we contain the disease, then you're going to have, you're always going to have that susceptible host, right? And that's going to allow the disease to continue spreading. So for me, that's the biggest lesson is we need to find ways and we need to develop a strategy that everyone within a country and everyone, every country can get on board with so that we have that coordinated action. Yes, and related to that, I'd like to ask uh, about, uh, of course, China was uh, uh, slow to kind of, uh, uh, you know, admit or publicize this new disease when it struck late last year. And similarly in 1918, the US and other countries hid the extent of the influenza pandemic for war related reasons. And this seems to be a recurrent theme in these epidemics slash pandemics, the countries don't want to admit in a timely manner what is going on when you can kind of nip it in the bud or prevent spread. Uh, how do you believe we can incentivize and international organizations can incentivize various countries and their own public health infrastructures and governments to report these things in a timely manner and be open about these, uh, about uh, potential new uh, uh, diseases and outbreaks? I really think the answer to that is financial rather than public health related because I think from if you look at every country that's hidden disease it's typically for a, a, a reason that's not public health related so China um, China reported quicker than they did in 2003 but still not very fast and and both times it was kind of this idea of if you tell people people won't travel here there will be a loss of income loss of tourism all this stuff will happen so I think in order to incentivize people to report diseases, we need to have some mechanism in place that supports those countries. Um, and I don't know what this would be. So these are just my rambling um, thoughts that kind of incentivizes them. Like if this happens and you report and then everyone shuts down travel to your country, there will be some mechanism that protects you financially so that they can take that concern off the table. And maybe that will make people more willing to report. And maybe that's part of what the pandemic insurance fund is for, I don't, I don't know. So, you know. And related to that, I was wondering, uh, do you see now uh, uh, in this, uh, you know, 
Uh, how do you see the future going forward for the WHO, which both has gotten a lot of attention, both for good and ill reasons during this pandemic? Uh, are these organizations going to see more money, more scrutiny, uh, more independence, less independence? What do you see, see happening going forward after our current experience? Um, I, I think a helpful thing would be for WHO to review, kind of do an after action report on what happened. You know, where were the weaknesses? Where were the things that they did well? Um, and how do you fix those, those weaknesses? Some of that might be, you know, some of the criticism just generally in global health for WHO has come from the fact that the regional offices are independent of the head office which makes it really, really hard for the head office to coordinate the regional offices and know what's going on on the ground in those regions. Um, so my hope, I guess I'll say my hope rather than what I know go, going forward is I hope there would be a review um, and I, then I hope there would be action taken to fix those challenges. And in terms of funding, um, I, I do think there needs to be a change to the current way that WHO is funded and the way it's funded right now, um, it, during the Reagan administration, uh, the US advocated to put a cap on how much money was given to WHO. And that cap hasn't changed with inflation. And so, you know, we look at some, or, or with how economies have grown. So we talk about China barely contributes every, anything, but they didn't have much of an economy compared to now in the 1980s, which is why that cap is so low. Um, so revisiting that, with the modern economies um, and how much their GDP is and how much they really should be contributing as a minimum, I think would be a good start to looking at um, how we fund um, WHO because right now the vast majority of it is voluntary, voluntary contributions and the US is the largest contributor of voluntary funds. Um, and so thinking about that, I think will be, would be something I'd like to see so that WHO can be funded in a more stable way. Ah, excellent. And uh, if we don't have uh, any other questions, uh, it's uh, 12.57, so I believe that is a, a good note to end on. Uh, uh, thank you very much, Professor Blackburn, for this very uh, timely and uh, informative uh, and enlightening presentation and taking uh, the time out of your day uh, from College Station to uh, to present to us. Uh, and uh, thank you for everyone who has attended. Uh, and uh, and uh, uh, next week, uh, we'll be having uh, uh, David Fields from the University of Wisconsin talking about the situation of on the uh, Korean Peninsula, uh, a, another time and matter, albeit in a very different way. Uh, and so uh, look forward to seeing all of you and many others then uh, next Thursday at noon. And again, thank you again to Professor Blackburn. This was very much appreciated and uh, we're honored to uh, have you having presented. Thank you for having me. Bye everyone.